I thank you for your prayers when I was ill over the last 10 days. Two weeks ago, we looked at the subject of the holiness of God. He is holy, holy, holy. I've preached on the holiness of God several times in this place. And I've preached on other attributes of God. Today, I'm going to preach on two of the attributes together, the holiness of God and the beauty of God. The Bible calls this the beauty of holiness. It's a beautiful holiness and it's a holy beauty in the one true God. And just like other attributes of God can can be combined. God has love and he has power It's a loving power and a powerful love. Go through all the attributes and see how you can match them up like that. But today we look at the beauty of God's holiness and then we'll see how that applies to us this morning. Please open with me in your copy of the Bible to Psalm 90. We'll briefly look at three of the Psalms. Three verses in the Psalms and tie them together on the subject, the beauty of holiness. Psalm 90 has always been one of my favorites. I've preached on it I don't know how many times, but I would direct your attention to the last verse. This was written by Moses, not by David. And at the end of his life, he says, let the beauty of the Lord, our God, be upon us. And establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The beauty of the Lord. Have you ever meditated upon that? The beauty of the Lord. God is beautiful. In fact, God is the very essence of all beauty. He is the very source, the matrix of all beauty. And he is the very zenith of all true beauty. He is beauty itself. Just like the Bible says God is love. Everything about God is love. Love comes from God. Same thing with beauty. One theologian said he is first beauty. Augustine said God is, quote, beauty at once so ancient and so new. Another early father, Gregory of Nazianza, said God is all beauty and far beyond all beauty. And he has shown us some of his beauty. We sang for the beauty of the earth. Where did it come from? Not through some evolutionary scale whereby things fall together and other things say that's beautiful. That's nonsense. God, who is beauty, displays his beauty in his creation, as it were, to point us to him. It's like beauty is saying, I'm not the beautiful one. Look at my maker. Just like a beautiful work of art displays the handiwork of the artist, even so with creation. And think of really beautiful things in creation. Flowers that are now beginning to grow and a rainbow after the rain, such as we've seen over the last few weeks. And in history, philosophers and artists have tried to define and describe why something is beautiful. They'll say, well, it has balance, correspondence to reality, matching hues, depth, and and things like that. Beauty is that which causes delight and pleasure to the eye. Just like we have five senses, and each one can be stirred to pleasure in various ways. We we smell a, a rose. We say, oh, the aroma, that's, that's a beautiful smell, as it were. Or delicious food to the taste, music to the ears, soft velvet to the touch. So we would say through our senses, we derive certain pleasure. We see something and our eyes are delighted by it. Therefore, we say it is beautiful. And we look out in the world, we say that some things are more beautiful than others. And God has put certain amount of beauty in people. That's why they have beauty contests. And in the Bible, certain people are singled out for their beauty. Certain godly women like Sarah 
Rebecca, Rachel, Abigail, Bathsheba, and Esther are called beautiful. Certain men are called handsome and beautiful men. Joseph, Saul, David, and David's son Absalom. It's been said that the most beautiful thing to a man is a woman. But the most beautiful thing to a woman is a baby. And when a woman comes walking in with a baby, all the women will look at that baby and say, oh, how beautiful it is. What's the most beautiful thing to a Christian? Ask non-Christians, what's the most beautiful thing that they've ever seen or imagined? And you'll get some interesting suggestions. But if you ask a Christian, what is the most beautiful thing of all? He will answer, God. God is the most beautiful being inside or outside of the entire universe. God is beautiful. But then this raises the question. If beauty is that which is pleasing to the eye because it's physical and it displays light and so forth. How can we say God is beautiful? God is not physical and we don't see him with our physical eyes. How then dare we say God is beautiful? God is spirit, according to the Bible. He does not have a physical body. His beauty is a spiritual beauty. And in this sense, as we see from the word of God, that which is spiritual always excels that which is physical. God is spiritual. His beauty is in his spiritual nature. And that gives us a hint. His beauty is not material beauty. It is moral beauty. And his moral beauty, therefore, is summed up in his attribute called holiness. For God has a perfectly moral beauty. It is a holy beauty. It is a beautiful holiness. Now, on this, I have learned a lot from that king of theologians, Jonathan Edwards. Let me read you something that he wrote. Now, I'm not prone to read more than just a sentence or two, but this is so good, I just had to share it with you. Edward said this, Holiness is a most beautiful and lovely thing. We drink in strange notions of holiness from our childhood as if it were a melancholy, morose, sour, and unpleasant thing. But there is nothing in it but what is sweet and ravishingly lovely. Tis the highest beauty and amiableness, vastly above all other beauties. Tis a divine beauty, makes the soul heavenly and far purer than anything here on earth. This world is like mire and filth and defilement to that soul which is sanctified. Tis of a sweet, pleasant, charming, lovely, amiable, delightful, serene, calm, and still nature. Tis almost too high a beauty for any creatures to be adorned with. It makes the soul a little sweet and delightful image of the blessed Jehovah. Oh, my, how the, may the angels stand with pleased, delighted, and charmed eyes and look upon with smiles of pleasure upon their lips, upon that soul that is holy. How may they hover over such a soul to delight and to behold such loveliness? How is it above all the heathen virtues of a more light, bright and pure nature, more serene and calm, more peaceful and delightsome? What a sweet calmness, what a calm ecstasy doth it bring to the soul? How doth it make the soul love itself? How doth it make the pure, invisible world love it? Yea, how doth God love and delight in a holy soul? How do even the whole creation, the sun, the fields, the trees, love a humble holiness? How doth all the world congratulate, embrace, and sing to a sanctified soul? That's pretty good. You might think, well, Jonathan Edwards, what a great theologian. I guess he wrote this in the maturity of his years. He wrote that when he was only 19 years old. For in his youth, he came to know God and early on appreciated the beauty of his holiness. 
Oh, that God would raise up other young people. Are you listening, young people? That you too would come to know God and know him in his holiness, his love, and his beauty. May God do it again. Let me give you a couple of other sentences from Edwards. Holiness is the very beauty and loveliness of Jehovah himself. Tis the excellency of his excellencies, the beauty of his beauties, the perfection of his infinite perfections, and the glory of his attributes. He that sees not the beauty of holiness, in effect, is ignorance of the whole spiritual world. A sight of God's loveliness must begin here, with a delight in his holiness, for no other attribute is truly lovely without this. So much for Jonathan Edwards. Now let's hear some more of the word of God. The Bible frequently talks about the beauty of God and the holiness of God as parallel lines, all pointing to God. Psalm 22, 3 says, you are holy. Revelation 15, 4, you alone are holy. Isaiah 6, 3 and Revelation 4, 8. Holy, holy, holy. Someone is counted up 28 times in the book of Isaiah where God is called the Holy One. He is the Holy One, the superlatively Holy One. Holy means separate from sin, pure, clean, sacred. God is perfectly holy, infinitely holy, eternally holy. Everything about God is holy. In fact, God is perfectly holy. He cannot sin. Not only does he not sin in thought, word, or deed, he cannot sin. He cannot speak an unholy word, cannot think an unholy thought. He cannot speak an unholy word. Nor can he approve any unholy thought, word, or deed. He is perfectly holy. Another great Puritan, Stephen Charnock, said this. About the holiness of God. This is the crown of all his attributes. The life of all his decrees. The brightness of all his actions. Nothing is decreed by him. Nothing is acted by him. But what is worthy of the dignity. And becoming the honor of this attribute. Everything about God is holy. We will spend eternity exploring the being of God, knowing the depths of God, who is infinite. Therefore, even in eternity, we'll never know everything about God. But, dear brethren, in all eternity, as we explore his being, we will never find one micron of unholiness. And it is our privilege now to know this God. All of his attributes are holy. All of his words. His name is holy. Jesus taught us to pray, Hallowed be thy name. We read his book. And it is not just a publisher's term to call it Holy Bible. It is holy. It is infallible. It is inerrant. It is the very essence of truth and holiness because it comes from God. So God has revealed his holiness through his creation, his name, his word. But the best revelation of God is his son. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the father. And everything good and holy about God is shown to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the very incarnation of holiness. In Luke 1, when the Holy Spirit came and made the announcement to Mary, he said, Mary, be not afraid. That which was conceived in you by the Holy Spirit shall be called holy, the Son of God. And everything about Jesus is holy and beautiful. One of my favorite themes, you remember I preached on this a year ago, taking my theme from that verse in in the Song of Solomon, Jesus is altogether lovely. Everything about Jesus is beautiful. Everything about Jesus is holy. Later we will sing, Fairest Lord Jesus, And it concludes, he is the beautiful Savior. Because when we look at Jesus, we see 
the beauty of God and the holiness of God in, in, in human flesh. Jesus is the beauty of God's holiness. And yet, Isaiah 53, 2 says that when he was on earth, people did not see this in him. He did veil it. He did not overwhelm people every day with the splendor of his glory. As it were, he had a holy veil upon him. But even then, nobody could see any unholiness in him. Nobody could legitimately accuse him and say, he said something wrong. He uttered something wrong. No, he was perfectly holy. But Isaiah 53, 2 says, we, we saw no beauty in him that we should desire in him. Why? The same problem then is the same problem today. Why people everywhere do not fall at his feet and worship him and adore his resplendent beauty. I'll tell you why. Because of sin. Sin blinds us. It's not just simply the veil upon him. It's the veil upon our hearts. We do not see his beauty because we do not want to see it. We are blinded by sin. Our eyes need to be opened and transformed. Now, let me put it to you, family of God. When Jesus was here on earth, he did give glimpses to us of the various attributes of God. When he worked miracles, he displayed power. When he answered people, he displayed wisdom. When did the Lord Jesus Christ best display the beauty of holiness in God? You might say, oh, I know. It was on that Mount of Transfiguration when he pulled the veil back and he showed his glory and his majesty to Peter, James and John. And they never forgot that. You would say, oh, the beauty of God and the holiness of God through Jesus Christ on that mountain. It must have been wonderful. But that wasn't the best display of the beauty of holiness through Christ. Not on that mountain. But about a year later, on another mountain, Mount Calvary, when to the naked eye of man that was sinful, it looked like the very epitome of unholiness and ugliness. A man dying on a cross. Who wants to look at that? And so it says in Isaiah 53, we turned our eyes away from him. But yet, if you see by faith, you will see the beauty of holiness at the cross. Let me quote Stephen Charnick again. Never did divine holiness appear more beautiful and lovely than at the time our Savior's countenance was most marred in the midst of his dying groans. Do you see it? Do you see rays of beautiful glory and holiness emanating from the Lord Jesus Christ as he prayed Father, forgive them. And as he suffered for our sins and as he bled for our sins. We should strike our hearts and look at him and say, Lord Jesus. You were never more beautiful and never more holy than when you were on the cross, the holy one taking our unholiness, the perfect one being suffering for our sins. He was never more beautiful. Now, God, as God, is spiritual and has spiritual beauty. But I've tried to introduce you to this theme, why God became a man. He became a man to suffer, bleed and die. Another reason why God became a man and took on human flesh is so that God, who is spirit and is perfectly Beautiful in holiness in his spiritual being now can display that not only spiritually, but physically in the Lord Jesus, who said, he that has seen me has seen the father. And now in his glorified body, Jesus Christ is the most beautiful person in history. And that's what we will see in heaven. We will see him in his spiritual beauty and holiness and his physical Beauty and holiness, the two will become one. And he has a countenance of true beauty, true holiness. And the essence of of the beauty of holiness is seen ultimately and only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, 
A few weeks ago, we looked at Isaiah 6, and Isaiah was given the great privilege of going to heaven and seeing angels worshiping God, and he beheld God. And as he heard the angels say, holy, 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 what did he say? He said, woe is me, as if to say, unholy is Isaiah, unholy, unholy, unholy. Nothing will show us more of our unholiness than a glimpse of the holiness of God. Oh, yes, we should be reminded of that as we go through the world and see the beauty and holiness of God reflected in part in creation. When we see the beauty of a flower, we should say that's more beautiful than me. Flowers don't sin. I do. I am ugly. I am unholy. Sin is ugliness, for it is unholy. Holiness is the beauty of God, therefore sin is ugliness. And if Jesus Christ is the most beautiful person because he is the holiest, then who is the ugliest? I'll tell you, his name is Satan. Now, he has to disguise himself as as an angel of light, because if he dared come into the world and show himself as he truly is, people would run in repulsiveness. They would say, how ugly is he? Because he is the unholiest and most evil creature in the universe. But it's not just the devil. The devil has children. And just like the children of God are resembling their heavenly father, the children of the devil resemble their nefarious father. And who, who is this? We say, well, yes, the demons of hell. Those are the children of the devil. Yes, in a sense they are. They're more like his brothers and sisters. But the devil has children walking on earth, human beings. Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and you resemble him. You tell lies like him. You have an evil heart like him. Therefore, we're ugly like the devil. Look at yourself in the mirror and not just the mirror in your bathroom, but the mirror in the Bible. And you see yourself as you really are. I encourage you, I dare you to take a look at yourself as God sees you. How does God see us? You know, the Bible says man looks at the outward man. God looks at the heart. And the Bible says the heart of man is evil. It's it's despicable. It's grotesque. It's macabre. It's ugly. It's repulsive to God. Think of the ugliest thing you have ever seen or can imagine. That is beautiful compared to your heart. Because whatever you see or can imagine still has some glimmers of the glory of God. But our hearts far exceed any ugliness in creation or in imagination. Even beautiful sinners are inwardly ugly. Now, to fallen sinners, according to the Bible, sin is beautiful and holiness is ugly. That's why people despise holiness. They actually hate holiness. They hate it. They despise it. They have it upside down, inside out, and backwards. They love sin and they hate holiness. That's why you look at modern art, for example, that glorifies ugliness. And so here's where God's justice treats lost sinners that are ugly and says, oh, God says, oh, you love sin, you love ugliness. I'll give you a lot of that. In fact, You love ugly sin, therefore you will have an eternity to be with it. If heaven is the gallery of God's beautiful holiness, hell is the dungeon of God's of uh, of the punishment of ugly sin. And that's where he will send lost sinners. Now, as I said, some people are outwardly very beautiful. Some mentioned in the Bible. But inwardly, they're ugly. Jesus alluded to this in Matthew 23. Looking at the people that look so holy, the Pharisees. Oh, they had their religious gowns on, on, the tinkling of the little bells, and oh, they were just so magnificent. Jesus looked right beyond that and saw their evil, hypocritical hearts. And in Matthew 23, seven times he calls them hypocrites. And he says this, he says, you are like whitewashed tombs that appear beautiful on the outside. But inwardly, you are filled with dead men's bones. And I can't think of much more ugliness than a rotting corpse. And Jesus said, that's what lost sinners are like. Man sees the body. God sees the heart. 
Now, here's a lesson for us. We should strive for true beauty in our hearts more than in our bodies. Some people are gifted with a very beautiful or handsome body. But we often put more attention on the outward rather than inward. I would direct you ladies to 1 Peter chapter 3 where Peter specifically addresses this and says, don't let your, your beauty be merely makeup and gowns and, and jewelry. Those are not necessarily wrong, but he said, rather let your beauty be one of the heart. True beautiness is in the heart. According to the Bible, human beauty is temporary. Psalm 39, 11, you make his beauty fade away like a moth. Proverbs 31, 30, beauty is passing. I still remember when I was a young man, there was a number one hit song and it had this line. The woman said, young and beautiful, someday your looks will be gone. And that's true. Beauty is passing. It's fading. Psalm 49, 14 says their beauty shall be consumed in the grave. You know, every now and then you hear about these. Polls where they, you know, who are the beautiful people? And I read one once where, who are the most beautiful and handsome people of the 20th century? And as, as I recall, most handsome man, I think they put Elvis at the top. And for women, Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe has been dead for 50 years now. Within days of her death, her beautiful body began to corrupt and show ugliness. Same thing with Elvis. And in hell, nobody is adoring either one of them because their souls were lost. Beauty is passing. Outward beauty is fading. Inward beauty is growing and is permanent. Therefore, we should cultivate the beauty of holiness in our souls. Human beauty is fading. But the beauty of God will never fade away. It is perfect The beauty of God's holiness is perfect and eternal. Now, there's something else the Bible tells us about the beauty and holiness of God. They're one and the same with his glory. Exodus 28, 2 says certain garments were to be made for the priests in the temple for glory and beauty. Exodus 15, 11 asks, who is like you, O Lord, glorious in holiness? The beauty of God is the glory of God. God shows his beauty and is showing his glory. They're one and the same. It's a glorious holiness and a holy glory. The beauty of his holiness, therefore, is the glory of his holiness. Ephesians 1, 6 speaks about the glory of his grace, and that could be applied to all the attributes of him. The glory of his power, the glory of his wisdom. How about the glory of his beauty and the glory of his holiness? Now, As we think on these things, let me ask you this question. Do you love holiness? Do you love the beauty of God's holiness? Beauty is that which should produce a certain delight in us. Like when we see something that's beautiful, we smile and say, oh, how beautiful. When you meditate upon the holiness of God, do you have a similar reaction in your very soul that causes you spiritual delight? Do you delight in the holiness of God? Do you delight in God simply because he is holy? Specifically and ultimately, do you love the holiness of God? And do you hate sin as sin and as moral ugliness? The two go together to the degree to which you love God for being holy. You will hate sin as being morally ugly. Again, let me quote Mr. Edwards. Do you love God for his holiness? Holiness is the beauty of the divine nature and none but those who are holy love God for his holiness. This is why lost sinners hate God. Why? Oh, they may deny and say, I don't hate God. Oh, oh, oh. you just wait. You witness to them. You share the gospel. You tell them the old, old story. And old Joe might be nice and friendly because he roots for the same baseball team as you do. You tell him about the holiness of God and the ugliness of his sin, and you will see a different old Joe. He'll come out swinging. And you describe God as he really is in the holiness of God. And because of the holiness of God, and God hates sin and will destroy it in, in wrath, in hell... 
you will see lost sinners come out swinging, not only against you, but against God. And they will spit venom at you and against God. Because lost sinners hate holiness. And they hate God because He is holy. But, the Christian loves God because He is God and because He is holy. Now, here's the problem and here's the answer. We are lost, evil, and ugly sinners. We are morally repulsive to God. Think about that. God is not only angry with us, He is disgusted by us. You know, we see something that is ugly and we, we, we want to look away from it. We say, get that thing out of my sight. I don't want to look at that. It turns my stomach. God has a holy revulsion against our ugly sin. We are not fit to enter God's holy and beautiful heaven. And at Judgment Day, lost sinners will be shown for what they really are. You know, even the beautiful people here on earth, you know the people that are on the covers of magazines, and you see them on the television shows, and everybody wants to go and get their picture and their autograph. They're beautiful people with lost souls inside. One day, their bodies will be refashioned to resemble their ugly souls. Many years ago, there was a movie that kind of captured this. Now, I understand it was later remade. I didn't see the remake, but the original one was based upon a best-selling book around the year 1900 called The Picture of Dorian Gray. Dorian Gray was this dandy in London in the 1900s that, you know, he loved wine, women, song, and all the hedonistic pleasures, had no place for religion in his life. And he made a pact, as it were, with sin early on. And he noticed that over the years, as he got more decadent, his friends got older, but Dorian Gray didn't look any older. He was still young and handsome. But there was a picture in his house. He let nobody ever see it. The picture was an accurate portrait of his soul. And as he got more decadent in his sin, the picture got uglier and uglier. And eventually some of his friends broke in and they saw the picture and it was just ugly. And that when they did that, Dorian Gray underwent this transformation where his body resembled what his soul really was. What am I saying? God sees people as they really are. And if you are a lost sinner, God sees you as you really are. And on judgment day, the mask will be taken off. And not only will God see people as they are, but everybody else will see them as they really are. That's why the Bible says that saints in heaven, they're perfectly glorified and see people as God sees them, will now cheer as God punishes his enemies in hell by sending them to the doom that they deserve. We all deserve that. That's the problem. We need to know God. But God is holy and we are unholy. What's the answer? We cannot make ourselves good, holy, beautiful, righteous. We cannot take care of the sin problem by ourselves. Is it hopeless? Of ourselves, yes. But God is the God of hope. And here's where God's wisdom comes in. I call it a beautiful wisdom. God actually transforms us as he saves us. And makes us fit for his beautiful, holy heaven. Here's our second verse. Turn over to Psalm 149. I don't know if you've ever seen this verse. You may want to underline it. Go home, meditate on it for three or four hours. Psalm 149, verse 4. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. He will beautify them. He will transform them in such a way that he actually, he takes pleasure in us. How can this be? Well, let's look at this. It has two stages. And the first one is this. When God saves a lost sinner, and that happens in the twinkling of an eye, he transforms him. What God does is this. God not only gives him the new birth. But the Bible said God justifies him. God legally pronounces that sinner righteous. How can a righteous God do that for unrighteous sinners? How can a holy God pronounce unholy sinners holy? Just this. 
imputation. It's a great, glorious theological word. It's a Bible word. What does it mean? It means God takes the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ and puts it on our record. And when he sees the holiness of Jesus Christ on our record, he doesn't legally see our sins. He sees the holy righteousness of Jesus Christ. He sees the beauty of his holiness covering the ugliness of our unholiness. And therefore, God legally pronounces us justified, holy in his sight because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Earlier, I mentioned where it says that the robes of the priests back in Exodus 28 were for glory and for beauty. God takes the very beautiful robe of the Lord Jesus Christ, glorious, beautiful, holy, and puts it on us to cover up our unholiness so that he sees us clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the first stage where we are legally pronounced beautifully justified. But it continues because inside we are still unholy underneath those righteous robes. But God just doesn't impute the righteousness of Christ to us. He infuses us he, he, into us. He gives us the new birth. He puts the Holy Spirit in us together with justification. He now does sanctification. What sanctification It's the gradual progress where process where God gradually sanctifies his people and makes them holy. He gives them, as it were, a drastic makeover. Where instead of being ugly in holiness, God is beautifying us gradually. Doesn't happen immediately. Justification does. Sanctification is gradual. God actually transforms us so that we are spiritually holy And beautiful. Ephesians 5 says Christ sanctifies and washes his bride. Now, all brides are beautiful. As a pastor, it's been my privilege to perform weddings. And, you know, it's really nice. I'm thinking of one couple in particular when they came walking up the aisle. What was it, Matt? About three and a half years ago, you came walking up the aisle and I saw this handsome man and a beautiful bride. All brides are beautiful. The Lord Jesus Christ has chosen a bride for himself. It's called the church. All true believers are his bride. And you read in the Song of Solomon where she says, I'm not beautiful, but she is beautiful in the eyes of the groom. And the groom now washes us. He beautifies us so that when he presents us to himself at the wedding day in heaven, we will now be perfectly beautiful then. Perfectly sanctified, we'll be holy. And dear brethren, has it ever occurred to you that just like a human husband takes delight in his beautiful bride, the Lord Jesus Christ will take a beautiful delight in his bride when he finishes the process of sanctification and sees us totally sanctified, totally holy. It's as it were, he says, my beautiful bride, my holy bride. And now they're united to spend eternity loving one another and delighting in one another. Psalm 45, 11 says the king will greatly desire your beauty, your beauty. Song of Solomon 6, 4 says, oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Terza. And at our wedding in heaven, there will be perfect beauty. And oh, how the Lord Jesus Christ will delight in the beauty of holiness he has put in us. Here's another lesson. I got this from a Puritan. I wish I could take credit for it, but he said, children of God never despise even the least Christian. He said, if you could see that Christian as he will be in heaven, you would be tempted to worship him for the beauty of his holiness he will one day have. Isaiah 28, 5 says, On that day the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. For a third verse in the Psalms, turn with me to Psalm 29, which we read earlier. Holiness is beautiful to God because God is beautiful in holiness. 
And therefore, God takes delight in anything that resembles himself. He displays it just like in Genesis. He sees the world and says it is good. And he will make us holy one day and that will be a delight to him. Now, look at this verse. There's a phrase used five times in the Old Testament. Here's one of them. Psalm 29, verse 2. Given to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We find that in 1 Chronicles 16, 29, 2 Chronicles 20, 21, Psalm 96, 9. And in Psalm 1, 10, 3, it's in the plural, the beauties of holiness. Now, some scholars misunderstand this completely. They say, well, all this is talking about are those priestly vestments that the priest was supposed to wear to the tabernacle. Worship the guy with beautiful garments. No, 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 no. They miss it entirely. Others also miss it and say, well, the tabernacle was a beautiful building, so worship the Lord in this beautiful building. People today still make that mistake. You know how they do that? They say that when we come to worship God, therefore we should... Wear these holy vestments. You've seen priests, priests do this sort of a thing. And they, you know, they wear a gold chain. They carry crucifixes. And this man comes in wearing something that looks like a lady's nightgown. And people are impressed by that. Oh, this is holy. Look at the vestments that Father such and such is wearing. I just wear a suit. You just wear regular clothes. It's not talking about vestments. Other people think, well, we worship God by making a very beautiful building, cathedrals, with all sorts of ornamentations and red velvet carpet and all of this. Our building looks pretty plain compared to that. Because we keep it spiritual to maintain the spiritual beauty. Remember what I said earlier, beauty is something primarily spiritual, not physical. True worship is a matter of the heart with true beauty and holiness. So when it says here, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, it's not talking about the outer, but the inner. True worship is beautiful to God. He delights in it. Psalm 147, 1 says, praise is beautiful. We want to please our Heavenly Father, don't we? How do we please Him? Well, with obedience, which is holiness. And when we combine holiness with our worship, that is actually pleasing to God. He sees that it is pleasing, it's pleasurable, therefore it is beautiful to God. And just as the Lord Jesus said that true worship to God must be in spirit and in truth, dear brethren, this is the essence of this morning's message. True worship, to be delightful to God, to be acceptable to God, must be In the beauty of holiness. The elders in this church and others, such as the one that preached for us last Sunday, we emphasize this must be in spirit and in truth. Acceptable worship to to God must be based upon his holy word. God does not accept unbiblical worship. God does not accept unholy worship. When we come in our sins, that is not acceptable to God. That's why we must repent of our sins as we come into His holy presence. Like the priests in the Old Testament, before they dared enter the tabernacle, they washed their hands symbolically of repentance, saying, Lord, as I wash my hands, wash my heart, O Lord. Then they could come into His presence. In the same way, dear family of God, We dare not trample God's holy courts with unconfessed sin. God accepts no sinful worship. God says, you must worship me in the beauty of holiness. And he gives us that beauty of holiness wherewith we can worship him. What then is our responsibility? Seek holiness. Send away all unholy thoughts and feelings as we enter into God's presence. And as we worship Him here on the Lord's Day week by week, if we worship Him in spirit and in truth and in the beauty of holiness, we are getting a small foretaste of heaven. Heaven is a place of the beauty of God's holiness and the glory of God. And when we worship Him acceptably on earth, we are, as it were, taking the first step toward heaven. 
Everything in heaven is both holy and beautiful. Psalm 96, 6 says, Holy and mag- honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Therefore, God is beautiful in his holiness. And he says to us, You be holy as I am holy. He says, You be beautiful in holiness as I, the Lord your God, am beautiful in holiness. And therefore, we are to worship the Lord truly in the beauty of holiness. Now shall we pray. Lord, you are indeed both beautiful and holy. And how wondrous is the beauty of your holiness. You have shown it to us in various ways. You have spoken about it in your word. And it is in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have imputed his holy, beautiful righteousness to us. And your Holy Spirit is working this within us. And we long for the day when this will be completed in heaven. And we will worship you. You that are perfectly beautiful and holy. And we will then perfectly worship you in the beauty of holiness. And now, O Lord, as we approach your table, we sing of him, the beautiful one, the holy one, the Lord Jesus Christ. May your spirit draw us closer to him so that our singing and our communion would be in the beauty of holiness. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our communion is in your...